Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. We finished studying in our last lesson the prophecy about John the Baptist and began looking at the prophet's fiery sermon. I want to quote the whole sermon from Luke chapter 3, which is only a synopsis of the full message that John gave. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every one that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. We dug into verse 7, which is the opening of John's passionate sermon, where he directly preached to the religious leaders that came out to listen to him and see him baptize large numbers of people. John called them a brood of vipers, which is a very confrontational way to start a sermon. He went on to ask them a rhetorical question. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? What a great question that preachers need to ask their congregation. How many pastors and preachers have ever asked their congregation such a question? Not many, or the church wouldn't be in the dire shape that it's in. John asked this question because those religious leaders didn't go to hear him preach out of love or concern for him and his ministry. They didn't go to hear him because they were convinced of the truth that they were sinners and wanted to know how to escape the justice of divine wrath. They were enemies of John because they were enemies of God. They were hostile to the voice of God calling in the wilderness through John. The root problem with the Pharisees and Sadducees is that they thought that they were right with God when they weren't. They claimed to be morally and spiritually righteous because they believed in the Mosaic Law and thought that they lived out its requirements. Sadly, they were breakers of the law and blind to this fact. The Sadducees were a little different from the Pharisees. They didn't believe in eternal life and divine judgment. To them, salvation was the saving of the nation of Israel from the oppression inflicted upon them by the pagan nations of the world. They were the liberals of that day and equated God's favor in terms of material and financial prosperity. It could be said that they were the ancient version of the modern greedy prosperity message. Both Pharisees and Sadducees were in danger of hellfire because they weren't in right relationship with God. They were willfully ignorant of this biblical truth and thought that they were exempt from divine judgment and wrath because of their good works and upholding the Mosaic Law. Yet these same men, along with the lawyers and scribes, were well educated in the scriptures, so they weren't ignorant of the truth about divine judgment. Though they knew the Old Testament, they created a tradition of picking and choosing what they wanted to believe and not believe. This is a very dangerous practice that people are still doing today. To selectively believe what we want is to reject whole portions of the Word of God. This is how people, churches, and denominations create pet doctrines that aren't soundly supported by the Word of God. When people want to believe lies, then they will associate with those who believe the same lies. The old adage is true, birds of a feather flock together. Because of the very dangerous spiritual condition these religious leaders were in, John asked them a very loving question, Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? They immersed themselves in messages that sustained their deception and refused to listen to those who contradicted their error or exposed them for what they were on the inside. Live on a diet of cupcakes and cotton candy, and you will eventually loathe healthy food. Live on the message of cheap grace and that it's God's will for you to be happy and prosperous, then when the truth comes your way, you will reject the message and then be angry at the messenger. This is what the religious leaders were doing to John why they hated him and wanted him silenced. But a greater than John had come, and they would hate him all the more. These religious leaders had immersed themselves in the teaching that kept them in their unsaved condition. In striving to defend their doctrines and their way of life, they refused to let a voice from outside of their sanctioned teachers speak to them. They rejected any voice that confronted them of their sin and self-righteousness, especially anyone that would have the audacity to call them a brood of vipers and proclaim that they were outside of God's salvation. John continued preaching to the Pharisees and Sadducees in verse 8, declaring, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, 
For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. What John is teaching in this verse is one thought because the two parts of it are addressing the same problem. The problem is that these religious leaders and many people in Israel thought they were in right relationship with God because they were the blood descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The people of Israel were given specific promises from God through Abraham, the law of Moses, and the prophets. Through severe mercy, the Lord disciplined Israel for their persistent rebellion and idolatry. The nation itself was brought to the brink of extinction, and all that spared them were the promises God gave Abraham and the prophets. Then according to the promises of God, Israel was reborn out of the ashes of devastation that was inflicted upon them by the Babylonians. After their Babylonian captivity, the temple, which Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed, was rebuilt. Almost four centuries later comes King Herod, who became known as Herod the Great for his extensive building projects. His family was of Edomite origin, which means they were Edomites, an alien race that had no right to rule Israel. Though the family converted to the Jewish faith, they were brutal to the people of Israel. I'm not going to get into the history of this wicked man that gained rule over Israel through Julius Caesar in 47 BC, first as procurator and then as king. His building and beautification of the temple in Jerusalem were extensive. The religious leaders and the people by and large believed that they were safe from divine judgment since they were descendants of Abraham, were striving to uphold the Mosaic law, and had the temple and sacrificial system. They trusted in these rather than developing a genuine relationship with God. That's why John confronted them about there being no saving quality to their being descendants of Abraham. In context, John was preaching repentance to the multitude, and all the religious people did was look on with disdain. What a very sad picture this paints. When the teaching turned personal, the religious grew angry, and this is still the case today. People normally don't get offended when the Bible is taught, since it's mainly imparting information and knowledge. But preaching under the anointing of the Holy Spirit is a whole other thing because it's confrontational. This kind of preaching exposes the heart and mind of people and makes them see their sin for what it really is. This forces them to see their need of God and how they have offended Him. The religious leaders didn't want their heart and motives exposed. They didn't want to see the truth about themselves and what that means to God. I was a hippie that was saved in the early 70s in a genuine revival. I was truly born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit on the second day of my salvation. The main topic my first pastor preached was that you must be born again. He was a great soul winner. As these hippies were getting saved, the revival expanded. The pastor was always fishing for souls, and his example taught the young people to do so as well. But there was a weakness in his preaching that I didn't understand back then. He called people to be born again because life was hard without Jesus. So the overarching message was that if you are born again, your life will be better. You will be happy. For the most part, repentance was absent from the message, except as it related to the second coming of Christ. He didn't preach that we needed to be born again because we were sinners in danger of damnation. We needed to be born again so that we could be happy and ready for the Lord's soon return. It's not like there was a lot of sin in the church, because there wasn't. But holiness wasn't taught very strongly either. Because people were radically saved, they were bringing forth the fruits of repentance, even though that wasn't directly taught. The problem is, how can sinners get right with a holy God? Being born again is only part of the whole equation. We need repentance to be born again, and then we need to bring forth the fruit of repentance, which is a transformed life that's bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Because people are religious doesn't mean that they are born again, and if they aren't truly saved, then they can't bring forth the fruit of repentance, which is a Christ-like life. The Pharisees and Sadducees thought they were right with God because of lineage and keeping of the law, but neither can save a person's soul that in its unregenerate state is hostile to God. They needed repentance and to bring forth evidence that they had repented by the revolution of their inward life. The point that John made that the Lord could raise up children unto Abraham from these stones is true. The Lord created Adam from the dust of the earth, so what's the difference if it's a stone? It's no harder for him to do the one over the other. John was tearing down the cornerstone of the religious leader's self-righteousness, which was that they had issued from the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Rip that out from underneath them, and their trust in the Mosaic law and the temple have less substance. 
There was no benefit and nothing to trust in as being an offspring of the patriarchs when sin was ruling in their heart and life. It's irrelevant who the person is, since sin is no respecter of people. Sin brings ruin and damnation to everyone, regardless of their family tree or social standing. There's nothing and no one that can save people from sin except Jesus. Religion can't do it. The Bible can't do it. Water baptism can't do it. Good works can't do it. Only Jesus saves. He will only save those who take the path of repentance and give evidence of their repentance through a transformed life. John Wesley wrote on this point, stating, Trust not in your being members of the visible church or in any external privileges whatsoever. For God now requires a change of heart, and that without delay. What great advice! This change of heart is the result of repentance that comes through the grace of God and faith in action. John the baptizer goes on to preach in verse 9, The axe is already laid at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus made a similar statement in Matthew chapter 7, verse 19, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Then our Lord gave a parable in the midst of some strong preaching on repentance that's seen in Luke chapter 13. Beginning in verse 5, Jesus said, I tell you, no, unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone one more year. Then I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. An interesting point on these three portions of Scripture is that neither John the Baptist or Jesus the Messiah was against using the fear of judgment to persuade people to repent and get right with God. This style of preaching has been virtually abandoned in our wimpy snowflake church culture that only wants positive motivational talks. Such talks leave people in their sin, though it may grow large congregations. I just happen to think that Jesus knows better about redeeming mankind than a world bent on evil and a church culture suffering under the ravages of compromise and worldliness. Now let me get to the point of what John was preaching in his fiery sermon. He declared that the axe is already at the root of the trees. This is an expression of severe mercy in that it was already being inflicted upon the nation. As we saw in the parable of Jesus that I just read, there were practices that were done to help a fruit tree bear fruit if it wasn't bearing fruit or had bad fruit. In that day they would dig around the roots, fertilize it with manure, and in extreme situations even inflict pain on the tree to force it to get the sap flowing. The picture John is expressing in this sermon is one of severe mercy from God that's being expressed to Israel as a nation. But there was far more to this than judgment on a nation. This is very personal language that needs to be taken on a personal basis. Yes, God would judge Israel for their sin as a nation, but everyone will be judged for their own sin. As more people gave themselves over to sin, they became part of the reason why judgment fell upon Israel as a nation. We must take this warning very seriously, for its warning is aimed at us as well. God's blessing and protection rests on a nation because of righteousness. As a number of righteous people decrease in a nation, the heat of judgment is turned up, and we are seeing this in America right now and in the world as a whole. Some of the people of Israel were producing bad religious fruit, such as the Pharisees and religious folk. Other, like the tax collectors and peasant class, were producing bad fruit in general. Isn't this true today, where we have a portion of the church world that's on its way to hell, just like the Pharisees of old? Hell is hell whether people get there through dead religion, the deceptiveness of supposed good works, or by living an utterly hedonistic life that's consumed with the pursuit of personal pleasure. The axe is already being laid to the root of the tree, and Rome was the axe that was inflicting much suffering upon the people of Israel. We will all have an axe of discipline come tearing into us if we are obstinate against the convicting, saving work of the Holy Spirit. People are given an opportunity to repent, and it's the Spirit's work in our heart, mind, and conscience that's giving us this season of grace that leads to repentance. Here is an opportunity for people to begin bearing the good fruit that comes out of repentance. 
Yet we see in the account how the religious leaders were fighting against the hope the Lord was offering them and the people of Israel. Everything the Lord did back then was redemptive in nature, just as it is in our day. Rome was one axe laid upon Israel, so that they might feel the pain of their sin and turn to the Lord. Blow after blow was laid against the nation, and how they responded to this would determine the final outcome. Bow in reverent worship and submission to your rightful king, or suffer the consequences. This is a loving message, a message that warns people rushing to hell to change course, or they will rush off a precipice and plummet into the depths of hell. Love warns, and it's not love that doesn't warn. Would a mother truly love a child if she saw her little one reaching a hand to a fire and say or do nothing? If a house is on fire and screams for help are heard within, would it be a loving thing to watch the house burn to the ground and do nothing to rescue the people inside? John was screaming out a loving warning to the people whose house was burning down, both in his day and in ours. The problem is that we are willfully prone to be deaf, dumb, and blind to this reality, to continue living the very life that's being burnt down through the practice of sin and to know the outcome is insane. Not just that. Those who hate the truth hate the messengers that warn them of their coming doom. That's why John went on to warn, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. In the case with Israel, Rome would be an axe laid to the nation's tree, and over a million Jews were killed in the brutal response to Israel's rebellion in 70 A.D. Yet Rome could only be the axe to cut the tree down, not the judge to whom every person must give an account. Rome was only one axe. There were many others, such as governments, wars, aging, sickness, suffering, and the list goes on. The axe is metaphorically an instrument God uses to bring people to the place of repentance. Whether they repent is up to them, but God is good to use the trials, pain, and suffering to force us to decide what we will do with Jesus. Every person will die and give an account before God. In this life the Lord will allow the axe to be laid to the root of our tree, that we may wisely call out to God in our need and pain, so that we may be saved. The wording of this is in the present tense. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree that's not bearing good fruit. There are consequences for sin, and the Lord uses these to cause us to stop pursuing the idols that are ruining us. For those who belong to Jesus, He is actively pruning us so that we bear more fruit, sweeter fruit, fruit that will remain throughout eternity. But for those who reject God's mercy when He calls them to repentance, all that's left is eternal damnation, which is separation from God and all that He is and offers. The thought behind the fires of hell is a warning that's meant to fill us with dread of divine judgment. The judgment is real and the terrors of hell beyond reckoning. The only ones that will escape the fires of hell are those who bear good fruit, which is what comes out of genuine repentance and submission to God. Since this is a fact about eternity, shouldn't we, through the love and kindness of God, warn those who are rushing to hell, who will give an account before God? Some commentators think that the phrase, the axe is laid to the root of the tree, means that the axe is set at the root of a certain tree as a mark that it will be cut down. Like I said earlier, this is written in the present tense, so it's not something that will happen in the future, but is happening right now. As Leonard Ravenhill used to say, this life is a proving ground for eternity. We are either on our way to heaven or rushing to hell. Those who are on their way to heaven will have the Holy Spirit trimming away the bad branches and those sucker branches that take the life from the fruit. Those that are on the way to hell are having the axe laid at the root of their life. Its initial purpose is to lead them to repentance. But if they reject this precious gift of God, then the axe will continue cutting away at the tree until it falls, and then it is thrown into the fire. Since it's not God's will that any perish, every soul that does perish was a needless waste. They didn't have to be cut down and thrown into the fire. The only one to blame for those who suffer the horrors of hell are those who go to hell because they were willful sinners that rejected the only remedy. There's an interesting point with this that I want to mention before we move on. The way this verse is worded, the judgment for sins which the people committed were the sins of omission, not commission. What was the crime that was deserving of damnation? That they didn't bear the good fruit that they were created to bear. The religious people thought they were right with God because they weren't committing sins of commission, which is purposely practicing sin. Because they thought they were good, 
They didn't see their obligation to bear good fruit according to God's definition. Many will go to hell because they failed to do what was commanded by God and what's required of a true disciple. These are the sins of omission. Others go to hell because they are actively pursuing evil. Either way, the end is the same, eternal separation from God. The path to eternal life goes through Jesus Christ, and this is defined by loving obedience, both in not doing what is forbidden and in doing what is commanded. Just as we were given a condensed version of John the Baptist's sermon, so we are given a condensed version of the people's response to his fiery message. Under deep and profound conviction, they asked in verse 10, What should we do then? This is the only right response to a sermon preached on the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Notice that John didn't ask the people to repent, but commanded them to repent and to bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. I imagine that the people who responded to the preaching had been baptized by John and his disciples. They were inquiring not only how to get right with God, but how to live a life that continues or abides in right relationship with Him. What comes after repentance is just as important as what comes through repentance. When true godly repentance is working in people, it will always produce a life of holiness. The importance of this cannot be overstated. The Apostle John made it one of the themes of his first epistle to boldly declare that those who practice sin don't know God, and those who authentically know Him don't practice sin. I'm absolutely astounded at how many people think they are right with God when they are in the blatant practice of sin. This shows how deception gets a firm grip on people and this comes through the hardening of their heart to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. A story recently came to me how a person was just beginning to plunge into some terrible sin and by the mercy of God was caught before it totally overtook this person. The first encounter with this sin was tantalizing, yet filled with heart-wrenching guilt. The second time the thrill was there, but the conviction was less. The person was slowly hardening the heart. With each successive plunge into sin, the guilt grew less, while the addiction to the sin grew more. At the same time, the deception became more gripping. Even if this person totally turns from the sin, the door to evil had been open and will haunt that person all the rest of their days. Yes, there's forgiveness, but forgiveness never means that the evil wasn't committed and even loved. When we repent, the Lord removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. Nonetheless, the sin was committed, and the memories will be as wounds. In time, the wounds will heal, but they will leave an ugly scar. There are always consequences to sin. Some consequences fall on us quickly, others increase over time, and still others are reserved for the day of judgment. There's always a price to pay for sin, and the price is more than we will ever want to pay. The people that cried out, What must we do? asked a very good question. It's not asked by many church folk, otherwise they wouldn't be in the practice of sin and self-deceived into thinking that their sin isn't a big deal. Before we will ever change, we must make the question personal. What must I do? We must have a heart and conscience tender enough to let the Holy Spirit convict us. To say no to the conviction of the Holy Spirit is to say no to God. This is sure to harden the heart and further separate us from God. Yet it's the kindness and love of God that leads us to repentance, as Paul told us in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Experiencing guilt from our acts of rebellion against God is a very good thing, for it's the only way we will be led to repentance and forgiveness. Since none of us are sinless, the absence of guilt should terrify us, because it means that we have let our heart grow hard by constantly refusing to listen and obey to the voice of God commanding us to repent. This is why John's message of repent was a loving message that was sent by God to confront the hard-hearted people so that they could find true hope and salvation through repentance. In the next four verses, John addressed their question, and we have a highlight of his response. Before I go into these three categories of people that John addressed, I want to point out that John isn't teaching a works-based religion as if all that's needed to offset our sin is to perform a few good deeds. When an inward work of grace is taking place in people, there will always be an outward manifestation. When a person's character is being transformed by God, everyone will see the outward evidence of this miracle in how we act, talk, love, and live. In verse 11, John gave a general command saying, The man with two turnips should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. 
When repentance is doing its good work in us, then the selfishness that defined our life of sin and separation from God should begin to die. In place of the sin and selfishness that once defined us is the power of Christ's resurrection growing in us a new life that includes compassion. This command to share with what we have with those in need has nothing to do with wealth, but with loving others selflessly like Jesus loves us. And this isn't a command to live in poverty, as if poverty is a noble thing in and of itself. Nor is this a Christianized version of communism where everybody shares everything in common and no one owns anything. This is all about being delivered from self. This is where we get our eyes off of self and begin to see the needs of others and then meet those needs according to our ability. Compassion is one of the fruits of salvation that gives evidence that God's love is beginning to define us. Giving food and clothing is about meeting the basic needs of others. This isn't about giving your old clothes to some charitable organization, but becoming personally involved in people's lives for their temporal and eternal good. To give money to people begging on street corners isn't loving because you are only supporting their addiction or the problem that put them on the street in the first place. Compassion needs to define us and not be merely something we do. When God's compassion is working in our life, the natural sympathy will be conquered. God's love will compel us to do for people what will be for their eternal good. Out of compassion we are to meet the physical needs of others, but the greater need is the condition of their soul, and this should always be our greatest concern. To feed and clothe people only for them to spend an eternity in hell is certainly not genuine compassion. It was the love and compassion of the Father that sent the Son to be our atoning sacrifice, and it was the compassion of Jesus that compelled Him to come as our Savior. The Lord didn't merely feel sympathy for people rushing to hell and say, Poor people that will burn in hell, I feel so sorry for you. No, God operates through compassion and selfless love. He didn't just give us a remedy to our sinful condition. He became the remedy we desperately need. John is commanding us to have the heart of God in selflessly loving others like the Lord loves us. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. So come wash in the river Come drink your fill Let healing waters Bear away